So the title of this talk is Beyond Inclusion. Uh, Gesturing Towards the Colonial Futures is the name of my research collective. So I'm going to be today talking a little bit about the research collective. So I selected some information for, for the beginning so that you see where I'm coming from. That's part one. In part two, uh, I called it cartographies of inclusion. So maps of different understandings of inclusion. And I tried uh, to put here a new cartography that we have, which is looking at inclusion, ideas of inclusion across generations, especially the, the four generations that we have that are still struggling today to understand each other. And then uh, the third part is called Beyond Inclusion Artistic Experiments. So I have seven experiments and I will ask you to choose um, which ones you're, you'd like to have a look. Uh, so be prepared to, to talk a little bit on the chat and choose. Uh, I don't think we will have the time for all of them, but you will be able to, to see one or two or three maybe, depending on the time, depending on how fast I am with the rest of the presentation. So part one, the collective itself, which is called Gesture Towards the Colonial Futures. This is a transdisciplinary collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, and indigenous knowledge keepers. So we work a lot with a network of community, indigenous communities in the South, like in the Global South, in Brazil and Peru, and also uh, here in Canada. And we work at the interface of questions related to historical, systemic, and ongoing violence, on the one hand, and then questions related to the unsustainability of our current habits of being. Generally, what you see is that people who work with questions of violence, racism, colonialism, um, and other types of, of subjugation do not work with questions of unsustainability related, for example, to the climate crisis, to biodiversity laws, and to the unsustainability of the economy. And what we're trying to do is put the two things together. Therefore, we bring together concerns related to racism, colonialism, unsustainability, climate change, biodiversity loss, economic instability, mental health crisis, and intensifications of social and ecological violence. So we work with issues that are extremely heavy. And one of the things we try to do, like the main thing, is to create pedagogies or pedagogical containers for us to be able to have difficult and painful conversations without relationships falling apart. So in, in other words, we need to um, expand our capacity to hold space for difficult and painful things without feeling immobilized, overwhelmed, or wanted to be rescued from discomfort. And that's mainly what we try to do through the arts, through land-based experiments, and through experiments that involve the body. So most of the artists we work with are artists of the body. So people who work with uh, performance, uh, or living installations or community projects that involve the body. So uh, one of the things that is very important for the collective, that is very important for education too, is this idea of wicked global challenges. So wicked global challenges are different from regular challenges because they are hyper-complex, multi-layered, interlocked, which means that the solution for one thing creates problems in other places. They involve many unknowns. They have longer and uncertain time, time scales. So questions of um, minorities and immigration fall into that, for example. And our formal education does not prepare as well to address wicked challenges and the complexities, uncertainties, ambiguities, pluralities of views and aspirations, paradoxes, unequal power relations and conflicts that are inherent in these problems. So if we address wicked challenges as regular problems, our interventions, including research interventions, will tend to reproduce harmful patterns of, number one, simplistic feel-good solutions that may address symptoms, but not the root causes of the problems. Number two, paternalistic engagements with marginalized communities. And number three, 
ethnocentric ideals of justice, sustainability, and change. So our analysis of, of global challenges then is based on a decolonial psychoanalytic approach. And what I mean by decolonial is that it uh, sees colonialism as part of the root cause of the problems. And colonialism here is not just about the uh, subjugation of people or the occupation of lands. This is actually a symptom of what we are talking about. We're talking about our imposed sense of separation from the whole. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Psychoanalytic, uh, the part about psychoanalytic, it's not a Western form of psychoanalysis, although there are resonances here, but the psychoanalytic is that it considers the unconscious. It doesn't only think about people as the stories they tell. They look at what's behind those stories, the fears, insecurities, investments, and uh, the harmful desires that we are inculcated into that come with that in the different periods of history that we live. And this decolonial psychoanalytic approach is based on four denials. The analysis is based on four denials. So the first denial, the first uh, is the denial of systemic violence and complicity and harm. So the fact that our comforts, our securities, our enjoyments are subsidized by expropriation and exploitation somewhere else. So for example, if we think about the computers we're using to talk in this conversation, uh, we have to remember that this the, the minerals for these computers were mined somewhere else in processes that were quite violent for the communities and for the land where they are mined. So by enjoying this uh, computer and the technology and the internet, we are also contributing to that violence, especially if we deny it or if we forget. So it's a kind of a sanctioned ignorance. It's better that we forget these things unless uh, otherwise we're not gonna be able to enjoy them. So that's what systemically we are trained to do, to not remember that everything around us, our clothes, our food, come from processes that are uh, violent and extractive. So the second denial, is the denial of the limits of the planet. The fact that the planet cannot sustain exponential growth and consumption indefinitely. And we may be reaching a lot of tipping points. The third denial is the denial of entanglement. What I was talking about before in relation to colonialism. So our insistence in seeing ourselves as separate from each other and from the land rather than entangled within the living wider metabolism that is biointelligent, that is the planet. So the, our sense of separation from the planet has several implications even for our neurobiology. In this uh, separation, the denial, uh, the, the denial that this separation entails, which is the denial that we're not separated and uh, we're part of something living and we may be go <laughs> Uh, walking towards our own extinction is one of the things that this decolonial psychoanalytic approach addresses. And then the fourth denial is the denial of the magnitude and complexity of the problem. Our tendency to address symptoms rather than the wicked nature of global, of, of global challenges, as I said before, that then creates the three patterns uh, that I also mentioned, simplistic solutions, paternalistic engagements, and ethnocentric ideals of justice change and sustainability. So from this analysis, another thing that is important to, to say is that we are working in a very different social educational learning context. And it's marked by, by many different things, but one of them in a big one is technology. So we have a cacophony of perspectives and misinformation overload. So there's an impossibility of stable authorities and there's a lot of sensationalization of information. So in this sense, uh, what would be um, interesting to say is that we are thinking, we're we are <laughs> people who, are, who have uh, been brought up in this, uh, in the world where their relationships are mainly 
um, established through virtual connections or exercised through virtual connections, they think more in slogans or in, in, in memes rather than um, generations before who had not had this technology who would think through, uh, let's say, the, the, the um, archetype of books, right? So we would be thinking in terms with, with arguments and thought processes organized as arguments, uh, as, as in the arguments we find in books, rather than in memes or slogans, or tweet, Twitter, tweets in the in um, or photos on Instagram. The second thing is the speed of change, uh, and, and this this is the sense that the ground moves as we walk. So politically, uh, the gap between uh, change, the speed of change for our parents and for our children, is the largest that we're finding uh, across the history. In this gap has several implications also for us, because we were trained for a world that didn't change that fast. Whereas um, children who are being born now, or, or the teenagers who have um, been born into a world that are fast changed, they adapt much quicker. Number three is the oversaturation of unprocessed emotion. It's a lack of resilience. So as we are overwhelmed with information, there's no time or no teachings anymore about how to process this at, at an effective level. And this oversaturation of emotion comes up as uh, fragility, lack of resistance, or sometimes aggression and violence as well. Uh, number four, there's increased social complexity, fragmentation and conflict as a result of also the unprocessed emotions and a general lack of capacity to hold it together when, uh, when, when there's a crisis, when, um, when we have um, conflicts. Then five, there, is, there are incentives for hedonistic, narcissistic, and hyper-individualistic behaviors. Uh, we have now consumption as a mode of relating to the world. I'm not just talking here about consumption of stuff or things, but also consumption of knowledge, consumption of relationships, consum consumption of experiences. Um, and these incentives for hedonistic, narcissistic, and hyper-individualistic behaviors are reward, uh, like, so in, in that sense, we are rewarded, socially rewarded for, um, for uh, manifesting this in ourselves. And number six is self-infantilization. Um, we have hope as projection rather than relational weaving. Generally, um, uh, hope, for example, for many of the indigenous communities we work with is not a, an image in the future that we all imagine together and we, we kind of go there, we try to go, plan to go there. Hope is actually how we can uh, weave our relationships today because it's the quality of relationships today that will determine the future tomorrow rather than an image or a fantasy or a delusion that we have in our heads. So this, um, this form of hope as an, uh, an image in the future creates a form of self-infantilization or a demand for coddling and rescuing. So a lot of the things that we find, for example, when we raise questions that are difficult and painful and try to hold space for that, is that people come back to us and say, I want hope, and like, but they want that other kind of hope. They want to be told things are gonna be fine, they're gonna be all right, and that uh, they, need, they don't need to work very hard actually. So what we're trying to do is just reimagine or, or invite a reimagination of that hope for the hope in the present. The hope that we will wake up to, <laughs> to the reality of the situation. We will be able to sit with this reality and then learn that we need to do something together and we need to relate differently to each other and show up differently. And in many cases, as a, a both individually and as humanity, we need to grow up. So one of the, the tools that we have, just for you to have an idea of what we do, one of the tools that we have for holding space is a tool called the bus. The image of the bus is not the most important thing, but this is an image that actually has, uh, is very useful, but it can be any other image uh, that we can use to do the same thing. So what we're trying to do with this image is to invite people to imagine there's 
a bunch of different voices inside of them. So we can use uh, the image of a bus to do that. So there is a generally a driver, and then there are people, passengers at the front of the bus, in the middle of the bus, and at the back of the bus. And these passengers have conversations. Sometimes they don't agree with each other. And at a very basic level, because the, the bus methodology is very com uh, very complex and it has many different <laughs> stages. But the basic level here is that uh, we need to recognize, if we don't recognize the complexities of just the layer of ourselves, our own lives, that there are uh, many different voices and contradictions within ourselves. We cannot expect to have the stamina to hold space for the complexity outside, right? So the bus helps you to, or us all in the group process, to interrupt the univocality of the self, the self-transparency and the desire for imposed coherence that we have inside ourselves. So this is again, a psychoanalytic um, tool, but that helps a lot uh, in holding space for difficult conversations, because then we, we can take a step back and observe, for example, what's happening on our bus. And when we learn to observe that with time and with practice, we build capacity for heteroglossia. This is a term that's coming from Bakhtin, but it's this idea of working with multiple voices, both within ourselves and outside ourselves. Then there's diachronic reasoning. Diachronic reasoning is understanding that each of these voices is coming from somewhere, both effectively and intellectually, um, and relationally, right? And it's going somewhere. So something is coming from somewhere and it's going somewhere and, and, and learning to layer that and to understand that in a more complex way. And the other thing that it does is that it contributes to the development of ontosympathetic resonance, which is our ability to feel what other people feel, not as a form of, uh, empathy, but as a form of tuning in, because empathy generally is us projecting what we think other people are feeling onto other feeling. But onto sympathetic resonance is different. It allows you to actually tune in and, and feel, even if we can't describe or understand, you feel especially pain, uh, the pain of others, but also the joy of others, right? Uh, you can, and in this methodology, it's not just about human beings. You feel the pain of the land. We feel the pain of the other species that humanity is um, taking to extinction. We feel the pain of a forest that is, be, that is being destroyed, like the Amazon forest, right? So this is the kind of thing that we're trying to do with a tool like this. Uh, so I will ask you today to imagine you have a bus within you <laughs> and to observe what's happening in there. Observe in a detached way. So just pay attention to what's, what's going on. If things arise, like sometimes it's uh, anger, resistance, sometimes it's um, discomfort, uh, observe it without investing in it. Turn all these things into your own teachers uh, instead of um, embodying it. So instead of uh, being the wave, be the sea <laughs> and hold everything together because the kinds of things we have we, we will need to do and talk about uh, as a collective as society um, as things are getting more complicated are not going to be easy and we need to build capacity to hold space for these difficult things um, in ways that uh, relationships do not fall apart and that starts with the relationships within this bus so that was the first first part of the, oh, no, sorry, one more slide about uh, gesturing towards the colonial futures. Um, our methodology, our main methodology is called SMDA, and SMDA is a compass. SMDA stands for Sobriety, Maturity, Discernment, and Accountability, when we're dealing with any issue. Um, and we talk about this in relation to a tightrope, learning to walk a tightrope. And this tightrope is, uh, is placed between desperate hope and reckless hopelessness. 
And so desperate hope is about trying to find something to hold on to that is easy, like a right ideology, a heroic authority, the chosen people who will save us, a special practice or a return to a time and space. Reckless hopelessness is like this everything goes or hedonism, misanthropy, which is the hate for humanity itself, nihilism or the banalization of brutality. So this tightrope is a tightrope that says we can't fall into either one. We need to walk uh, with a bar of intellectual rigor and relational rigor. And in this tightrope, we learn to walk with honesty, not turning our back to the reality and the difficult things, with humility, with humor, and with hyper self-reflexivity. So humor is actually extremely important here neurobiologically because without some humor, we can't, uh, it's, it's too heavy and it, it drags us into uh, a relationship with pain that is not very generative. So if you want to hold things that are both painful and difficult <laughs> um, collectively, humor is what the communities that we work with, especially the indigenous communities, uh, they are teaching us that is is uh, absolutely necessary. So, for example, even um, we we lost a colleague very recently, uh, and in the memorial for this colleague, uh, the, the the grieving of indigenous people was very different from the grieving that we found um, in Western societies. So, for indigenous people, it was very important. Number one, that we did it collectively that we would spend a lot of time and in times of, of the pandemic, this time was on Zoom. So we, we would spend a lot of time for three or four days together. Number two is that we talked about the deceased person um, in, in, in brought back the funny stories about this person because our laughter would be paving the way for this person to go into the next stage of, of their life beyond life. And the third thing was that we also needed to talk about uh, the, the things that this person had, also the contradictions and the, the things that this person was learning as well. So in Western society, we're not supposed to talk about uh, complicated matters of the person. In this process of grieving, we talked a lot about this person as a flawed, fallible, and fabulous person <laughs> at the same time. So there is more complexity. And this is all brought out in the open so that we are reminded uh, that we are all also fallible, faulty, <laughs> and fabulous. So um, with that, I will finish this part and go to part two, which are cartographies of inclusion, and I'm going to check the time. Okay, so we're good. So these cartographies are actually uh, still uh, being worked through, and um, I would love to hear some feedback at the end too about them. And we're doing them intergenerationally, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that as we, I talk about them. So the first thing about um, our cartographies of inclusion is that we need to remember that our modern economies, our modern intellectual, affective, and relational economies, they are based on a dynamic of plus one minus one. So what I mean by this is that um, you are either uh, up the seesaw or down the seesaw, and we're really afraid of being down the seesaw. So plus one status means that um, we are better than other people, basically, and better than the, the what's the so-called nature, right? We're better than the other animals. Minus one is that we're worse. We're worse than other people. We're or worse than nature. We're worse than the other animals. So plus one is associated with idealization and romanticization. Minus one is associated with vilification, pathologization. And everything um, that uh, our, our relationship to the world is actually colored by this. We either idealize or we vilify. We either romanticize or we pathologize. It's very difficult to find the zero point of equanimity. Uh, and not just that everything is fine, but where we see the good, the bad, the broke, the broken and the messed up of humanity within us and around us, and not just of humanity, of everything, right? Including nature. 
uh, nature can be quite brutal, right? So uh, this is this is actually a lesson we we have been learning uh, a lot from indigenous communities as well that uh, it's very important not to romanticize nature, but not to vilify it either. So how do we get to this place of zero where we can hold space for everything within ourselves and outside? So the plus one, minus one uh, seesaw creates a politics that is very particular to this, which is the modern kind of politics, which is based on five E's, exceptionalisms. So generally in, in the politics, if you're thinking about politics right now, it's either one group that has the answers and claims to have the answer or, or another group. Um, exaltedness, so we, we elevate this group and I say this group is better, amazing, superior. It's about ego empowerment and our understandings of agency in this, in, in modernity are very much related to the ego. Uh, it's also based on the expansion of entitlements in the externalization of culpability. So we are the, uh, so there's a problem, if there's, if we believe there's a problem in the world, we are the good people, we are exceptional and who are going to solve it. And it's somebody else, we are not implicated in the problem, right? We say it's the court, like for example, for climate change, it's the corporations, it's the governments, rather than we are actually contributing every day, every single day for this to happen and our enjoyments, our comforts are all tied up in this, in, in what's wrong, right? In what's destroying the planet. Um, same thing with, uh, with uh, when we're talking about systemic violence and we're going to see that in the next, in the next photography. So here, uh, I cannot emphasize enough uh, how <laughs> <laughs> important it is to understand the different ways of thinking and relating that come with different generations. So this is a cartography of generations that we've put together with the younger people in our collective. So they have been telling us for a long time, like uh, we need to understand how, for, in their language, how boomers think about it versus Gen X, versus millennials, versus Gen Z. And to be honest, we had been kind of ignoring that, thinking that it was actually a bit too offensive <laughs> to be referring to us like that. But one day they sat us down and they said, look, you, can't, you won't be able to understand this if you don't understand these differences. And we'll stop calling you boomers or Gen Xers or millennials. We will, let's try to find other language that makes it possible for us to talk about it. So we came up with W, X, Y, and Z to refer to the generations that we have in front of us. So generation W is uh, people born from 94, 19, 1945 to 1964, which we would call the analog generation that they were born into an analog world and they had their formative years in the, in the analog world. Generation X, is from 1965 to 1984, which had an analog childhood in a digital um, adulthood, digital formative years. Generation Y is from 1985 to 2004. This is different from the general uh, distinctions that we find on the web, and there's a reason for that. But this generation we call the digital generation, and we chose these times because 1985 is the day is the year where the first dot com um, uh, domain was registered. So it's it actually marks for us in this cartography the beginning of the internet. In two thousand and four was the year where Facebook was uh, created. So this generation Y is digital, whereas generation Z or Z is virtual. So from 2005 to 2024, the people born in that period, they were born into relationships uh, mainly sustained through social media. So the, the virtual is the social media, the digital is more the internet, but without social media as a main um, uh, sustainer of relationships, then X, analog and digital, and generation W, analog. And this is important, to understand, so we use this to understand different things. So we use this for many different kinds of conversation, 
But when we talk about inclusion, you can see the differences. So for example, between, and this is happening at the same time, right? So this people in Generation W are still here um, in Generation X, which is where I, I belong. So for Generation W and X, for most people in this generations, inclusion is equated with assimilation. So there's demand for deference and gratitude from those who are being included. And there is a, a perception that they are a little bit of a bird for the, the, include, the inclusion space uh, and that they have, um, they have an obligation to appease those who have included them. For generations X and Y, people in that transition, inclusion is perceived to be uh, related to representation. So in that, in that's problematic too, because then you just pick and choose and you lift those that, can, that are perceived to be able to represent the others. And there's a demand for performance and for the validation of those who are listening in relation to those who are not. Like, so you're a good person because you're listening. In, in that case, especially here in Canada, when we where we have this very, very present today, there is this, um, this sense of consumption. So for, for example, in Canada, since 2015, there has been um, a resurgence of uh, indigenization, for example, because uh, up to 2015, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, through the government, and now there are recommendations and all institutions are trying to hire indigenous people, to listen to indigenous people, to include indigenous people in their curriculum and things like that. But then um, if it's done for not the right reasons, it becomes a process of consumption. You just consume it without actually changing anything structurally. Um, and then here there's this sense of white people's redemption. And I'm using the terms that I used here. I'm not sure if these terms would be appropriate to use in, 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 um, in Finland, but there's a lot of grappling with what it means to be a settler, especially what it means to be a white settler. And um, this is driven then by um, set white settlers wanting to be forgiven for being, for occupying the space, which is not probably the right, <laughs> the right motive to engage with indigenous people. And this is just an example. And then between gen, uh, generation Y and generation Z, Z or Z, uh, there's, there are calls for major systemic over, uh, major systemic overhaul uh, in the negotiation of terms of engagement. So here we are studying phenomena, a, a wide range of phenomena. It's not just one thing. People want different things. So for example, from roads must fall in South Africa to the cancel culture, to Black Lives Matter, to uh, what's happening in Colombia, for example, people were rising up in demanding things that in ways that were not possible before. These things were there before in different ways. But right now, what social media is allowing this to do is for it, for it to get to, to uh, have power and to harness the energy of Gen Y and Gen Z for this. And this is creating a problem for Gen Generations W and X because there is too much of a gap in between for people to be able to see if you're coming from inclusion and assimilation in meeting calls for a major, major systemic overhaul, there's going to be a clash. And that's what we're interested in. We're not interested in who's right, who's wrong here. We're interested in softening this, uh, the, the, the clash <laughs> or, uh, or um, uh, figuring out a way to hold space for all of this. Uh, with sobriety, maturity, discernment, and accountability. So I, I thought that I would talk a little bit about the pushbacks in North America to these three forms of inclusion so that you have an idea of how uh, this manifests in practice. So for example, for inclusion as assimilation, the pushback of the people who are supposedly included uh, and that people are hearing now is like, stop patronizing us. Stop treating us like we are your servants, objects of pity or study, or fake copies of yourself. 
For those uh, in inclusion and representation, the pushback is stop consuming us, extracting and appropriating from our culture. Stop using us as a currency to increase your virtue. And for those in the green one, there's a lot of pushback um, in relation to them as well, but the pushback here is no more of your demands. We won't be here on your terms, right? So you have all this uh, conflict arising between these different understandings of how to be together. And we are trying, what we, what we believe is that we lack a language to, to, to sit with this complexity. And we also lack the stamina, the effective structure to be able to hold space for that. So I, what I thought I could do with you for the rest of the time, and we, we have 20 minutes, would be to invite you to have a look at seven um, initiatives from the collective that uh, are related to this conflict of different understandings of inclusion. I will say that I will do number one, the brutal kindness, because this, this was a poem that actually came up in Finland. When I, I was there in, from 2010 to 2013 at the University of Oslo, in, in 2011, 2012, it was a period that was very difficult for the city of Oslo because there were um, number one, there was the economic crisis affecting Nokia. There was a lot of scapegoating of immigrants happening at the time. Um, uh, Pedro Suomalaisen was getting more seats uh, in government, and people felt emboldened to, ch to, to um, challenge immigrants. So sometimes I would be walking down the street and uh, somebody would stop uh, and I would be talking in English or in uh, Spanish with my students and um, somebody would stop me and, and, and say, you need to speak in Finnish. You've been here. <laughs> like if you're an immigrant, you need to speak in Finnish. Uh, that was also the time of um, the knife attack in the library uh, in Ivaskala. Um, and in my town, the, the, in all, there were three um, consecutive um, murders, one of them in the neighborhood that I lived, which was Meritokila, uh, where uh, it was a very multicultural neighborhood. And they were, these three murders were racially motivated. And um, the police at the time was refusing to look at it as a racially motivated uh, murder. Uh, of immigrants, basically, right? So my and I had lots of immigrant students. My students were extremely um, uh, afraid. And I, to be honest, I, I moved out of Finland because I felt uh, afraid for my life. Some of my colleagues who were Finnish, who were doing work on racism, were receiving death threats uh, and a lot of pushback um, from specific groups, right, within Finland. So. Um, the Bruto Kindness is a poem uh, that uh, I wrote with my students uh, or with them in the sense of bringing them together to think about what was difficult to talk about, what was not being heard. And this one is the first one that I'm going to do, but you can choose two more. So I'll just explain them and then I will ask you to vote on the chat. Number two is uh, a, 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 it, 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 is a, it was an installation that was created uh, here at UBC, uh, which is called Inclusion and the Racial Logics of Legibility. In this installation, I, was, uh, I worked with a group of artists and what we did was that we, we, we transformed my office into uh, a doll box and they dressed me up as, as different kinds of dolls. Uh, and the dolls would be, would have in the, in the box, uh, if you press my hand, this is what I say to you. So this was a critique of how <clears throat> multiculturalism is seen in Canada, because it's like it's a mosaic, right? But they put you in the place. What they say is that's the mosaic, but the, the glue is white. So you're put in a place you're not expected to perform in a specific way. So this is a critique of consumption, of diversity, that uses my office as a doll box, and it comes also with a short poem. 
Then there's number three, which is called Academic Indian Job Description. This is a poem written by Kesha Henneke, who's an indigenous person from here, who also criticizes how indigeneity and indigenous people are consumed in Canada. Number four, why can't I can't hold space for you anymore? It's also from an indigenous person saying, I'm tired of this. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't work with other Canadians anymore who are not indigenous because they also consume my body. And no matter how hard I work, it's only about them. It's always about them. Uh, they can't hear, basically. So it says it there. Number four. Five, want to be an ally. So here in Canada also, there's a lot of talk about uh, allyship and how to be an ally. And in this um, poem written by El Jimmy, uh, who is also indigenous, he talks about how a lot of people want to be allies to put it on Facebook, but actually they can't show up uh, in the communities and for the communities for the work that needs to be done. And he just lists how it could be different, uh, or what not to do and what to expect if you really want to do the work. Number six is social ego. So, um, and it's a UK project by artist Danny D'Amelia. It's a very, it's a short film uh, dealing with the question of whiteness. It's a, she's also white <laughs> and what she does in the film is that she works with uh, symbolic, um, symbolic artifacts like eggshells and mirrors and a, a golf um, a golf club over golden um, stones uh, looking at how and, and, and I have to say this one is also graphic in our collective we talk a lot about composting shit <laughs> and she took that very literally um, and so I, I there's a warning with this one it's very um, raw, uh, but uh, can be very effective if people are prepared to go there. So that's what I'm going to say about this one. And then there is the radical tenderness uh, invitation, which is version three. This one, um, there are several versions of this. I chose the, the 2020 version. Radical tenderness is about uh, being critical and loving at the same time. It's the same artist who did it. It's Dani the Media, and it has several invitations for us to be able to decenter ourselves, disarm our defenses, declutter our existence, be present to our own pain and to the pain of others so that we can be together in a different way. So this is what I'm going to say about this. I'm going to just try to not share the whole screen, and I'll ask you to choose one more of these in the chat. Just put the number there if you want the, of the one you want to see. So we will have the option. Um, I will do the brutal, brutal kindness poem and then you can choose one more. Uh, and it has to be done very quickly actually, otherwise we won't have time for two. So I will ask you to open your chat and tell me apart from number one, it's two, three, four, five, six or seven, what would you like to see? I now I can't see the chat anymore. Let me check new. I'll just have to stop share in a bit so that I can have a look at the chat. Why can't I see the chat? Interesting. More. Ah, uh -huh, I found it now. Okay. So there's seven, seven, five, five. Three, seven, seven, three, about reckless problemlessness. Yes, I will elaborate in the, when, in, when, in the 30 minutes that we have. Six, okay, so one, two, five. Hmm, very divided, actually. I think there are more seven, more fives, actually. Want to be an idler. Yeah, the mix between sevens and fives. So I'll start with... I will start with um, uh, brutal kindness, and then I'll see if I can do seven and five. Five is going to be an ally in radical tenderness. Okay, both of them have the same vibe, I think. Um, I will, yeah, want to be an ally might be, if we have the time for one, I, I'll go for that. But thank you for voting. So I'll just stop sharing this one. I'll share my other screen. Um, just quickly find where the, okay, 
here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Not this one. Now, desktop, it's not that Google Chrome found it. I hope this is the one that you're seeing. Can you see <clears throat> brutal kindness on the screen? Can yes. somebody just? Yes. Yes? yes. OK, yes. thank you. And I won't go through the whole poem. I'm just going to go just a little bit of it. And then we can do the other one. So it starts like this. We welcome you to our country. And this, remember, this is about Finland. <laughs> we welcome you to, your to our country. Our borders open only to a few. We ask for nothing in return except that you recognize the deepest wisdom that when in Rome, you should pay tribute to the Romans. Therefore, you must speak our language, admire our deeds, adopt our dreams, obey our laws, embrace our values, praise our intelligence, like our food, fulfill our expectations, mimic our behavior, contribute to our economy, aspire to be like us, commit to serving this country, dedicate your life to our people, and be thankful for our efforts to help you. We offer you unlimited hospitality. We choose you amongst countless others. We ask for nothing in return, except that you acknowledge the natural exceptionality of our people, expressed precisely in your inclusion in our society. Therefore, you must know your place, do as you're told, strive for your best, work twice as hard, feel indebted, show good manners, be clean and organized, get an education, dress appropriately, smell nice, pay your duties, lay low, be happy, focus on positive things, use language that we can understand, entertain us with your culture when requested, and jump off the balcony if required. We give you access to the best welfare and education system. We expect you to show us that you truly deserve it. We ask you for nothing in return except that you appreciate the privilege of being allowed amongst us. Therefore, under no circumstance should you break our trust, complain or communicate disapproval, expose our inadequacies, review our contradictions, disclose our insecurities, question our values, challenge our authority or understanding of reality, make up unreasonable accusations, fuel internal dissent, defy our rights to distinguish our heroes, Remind us of what we choose to deny. Speak of the past we want to forget. Outperform, outsmart, outshine us, or bite the hands that feed you. We will do everything in our power for you to properly fit in. We are certain you will acknowledge our benevolence. We expect nothing in return except your gratitude and compliance. And I'll stop there so that we have time for the other ones. So this is one brutal kindness. It was also published in a <clears throat> in an article, actually with the same name. I think it's called brutal kindness. So here I'll, I'll put the one one of the ally. This let's change it to <laughs> the Canadian context, right? Um, so what a BNLI was written by a collective of people and the person who uh, led this collective was Elwood Jimmy, who is a, an indigenous arts curator who, um, who lives in Toronto. So what a BNLI, don't do it for charity, for feeling good, for looking good or for showing others that you're doing good. Don't do it in exchange for redemption from guilt, for increasing your virtue, for appeasing your shame, for a vanity award. Don't put it in your CV or on Facebook or in your thesis. Don't make it part of your brand. Don't use it for self-promotion. Don't do it as an excuse to keep your privileges, to justify your position, to do everything except what would be actually needed to change the terms of our relationship. Do it only if you feel that our pasts, presents, and futures are intertwined and our bodies and spirits are entangled. Do it only if you sense that we are one metabolism that is sick and what happens to me also happens to you. Do it recognizing that you have the luxury of choice to participate or not, to stand or not, to give up your weekend or not, whereas others don't get to decide. Don't try to mold me or to help me or to make me say and do what is convenient for you. 
Don't weaponize me saying I couldn't possibly be a racist. Don't instrumentalize me. My marginalized friend says this and then you get uh, validated. Don't speak for me. I know what you really mean. Don't infantilize me. I'm doing this for you. Don't make your actions contingent on me confiding in you, telling you my traumas, recounting my traditions, practicing your idea of right politics or performing the role of a victim to be saved by you or a revolutionary that can save you. And expect it to be at times Incoher uh, incoherent, messy, uncomfortable, difficult, deceptive, contradictory, paradoxical, repetitive, frustrating, incomprehensible, infuriating, dull, and painful, and prepare for your heart to break and to be stretched. Do you still want to do it? Then share the burdens placed on my back, the unique medicines you bring, and the benefits you have earned from this violent and lethal disease. Co-create the space when I'm, where I'm able to do the work that only I can and need to do for all of us. Take a step back from the center, from the front line, from visibility. Relinquish the authority of your interpretations, your choice, your entitlements. Surrender that which you are most praised and rewarded for. Don't try to teach, to lead, to organize, to mentor, to control, to theorize, or to determine where we should go, how to get there, and why. Offer your energy to peel potatoes, to wash the dishes, to scrub the toilets, to drive the truck, to care for the babies, to entertain the kids, to separate the trash, to do the laundry, to feed the elders, to clean the mess, to buy the food, to fill the tank, to write the grand proposal, to pay the tab and the bail. To do and support things you can't and won't understand and do what is needed instead of what you want to do without judgment or sense of martyrdom or expectation for gratitude or for any kind of recognition. Then you will be ready to sit with me through the storm with the anger, the pain, the frustration, the losses, the fears, and the longing for better times with each other. And you will be able to cry with me, to mourn with me, to laugh with me, to heart with me as we face our shadows and find other joys in earthing, breathing, braiding, growing, cooking and eating, sharing, healing and thriving side by side so that we might learn to be ourselves, but also something else, something that is also you and me and you in me and neither you nor me. Okay, this is brutal kindness. Let me just check the time. We have three minutes, so I don't think we have the time for one more. I'll just show you where to find it. Um, on the on the thing, um, I think it should be this one. Oh, this one. Okay, so radical tenderness is also um, a set of cards that we have created. We have some to give away here in Canada, but if you're from other countries, you if you're interested, you would need to buy it uh, on the website that produces them. Um, but here you have an example of what you see in this invitation. So number one, stop trying to shape reality according to narcissistic desires for pleasure, comfort, and, con and convenience. Be receptive to the teachings of your shadows. Tune in with the collective body, both human and non-human. Feel your entanglement with everything, including the ugly, the broken, and the fucked up. Relate beyond desires for coherence, purity, and perfection and condition your intellectual, political, and affective muscles for facing storms and running marathons in tortuous terrains. So I think this gives you an idea of what the deck uh, is about. And there are about 55 invitations in the deck. And I'll stop there.